Well, probably like many, if not most of you, we had a great feast down in Oceanside. Uh, we had both of our children, Joe and his wife Ariel, and Jesse and Dylan, and little baby Carly was with us. Uh, we had a chance to spend a lot of time with Carly, which was really a highlight of the feast for us because, as you know, they live down in Tucson, and we don't see them very often. And Jackie had the fortunate uh, experience of having little Carly in her lap every single day, uh, all during services. We babysat a day. We spent time with them at lunch, dinner. We just had a fantastic, fantastic time, and it was just really a great time. We had a chance to see people we haven't seen in a long, long time and also make lots of new friends. It was a really nice experience for all of us. Uh, we were able to spend an extra couple days in Oceanside, and as I mentioned, the trip home was rather exciting yesterday, but uh, we had a great time anyway and just had a fantastic trip. But when we get back home, we said, it's always good to be back home. So we are glad we're home and safe and sound. Turn with me, if you would, today to begin with over to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4. All of that fun and excitement at the feast... all of a sudden came to a screeching halt yesterday. (laughs) Just like the rest of you, back to our lives, uh, responsibilities, and day-to-day tasks of just going about life and living. Uh, Sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge when you come off of a really high at the feast, and many times that's what's happening with us. We're on a spiritual high, a physical and emotional high. Then you come down and there's a little bit of a readjustment period of time. Uh, maybe having to get back in the groove or, in some cases, maybe get back into the rut of life that we are dealing with on a day-to-day basis. And it's it's not uncommon to have a little bit of a post-feast letdown. This is usually to some degree or another. Uh, Let's take a look at what Paul says here about living our daily, day-to-day lives. And maybe we can get some perspective from this. Let's begin in Philippians 4 and verse 1. Philippians 4 and verse 1. Paul writes here, he says, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Paul had a very fond relationship and feeling toward these folks in Philippi. Uh, They were a great church. They were a converted church. They were a loving, caring church. And he just longed to be with them. He wished he could have been with them, just like some of you probably wished you could have been with us because you had to stay back for the feast this year. And that's that's a tough challenge to be able to have to do that. Uh, But Paul was always reminding them how much he loved them and how much he cared for them. Then he goes on in verse 2. He says, I implore Euodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. This indicates that maybe these two individuals weren't of the same mind. These two individuals are maybe having some conflict between the two of them. And Paul was telling them, you've really got to work on that. You can't let something that's a problem between you and another individual be an ongoing issue because it's going to start dragging you down as a person and an individual. Verse 3, he said, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. In other words, be conscientious of the needs of others around you. Uh, who care for our brethren, look out for them, think about them, like we tried to do for those of you who had to stay behind. I mean, we had a list of everybody's name and address and everything, and we tried to encourage everybody to call, to write, to do whatever you could do. And we were able to accomplish our list of achievements at the feast this year. Uh, I got some writer's cramp writing to all of you, but that's okay. That's, that's, a, that's an okay a sacrifice to make because we were wanting to let you know that we didn't forget about you. We didn't forget that you were gone and we were gone and you were staying back. And that's one of the things that Paul is trying to encourage everybody to do. Be conscientious about each other's needs, each other's situation, each other's condition. Sometimes we see each other every Sabbath and we know that they're going through this trial. We know they're going through that trial. They're going through this trauma, that trauma. And we don't think anything of it after, after we see them at church. We just forget about it. Figure out everything will work out and I'll see them again next week. And that's not the way Paul is trying to tell us to live our lives here. Verse 4, he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice, which is what the theme was down at Oceanside. Rejoicing at the feast and enjoying what you're doing and being there. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. What Paul's pointing out here is that if we have Jesus Christ living in us, and I believe all of us believe that we do, if you've been baptized and you've had hands laid on you, then God's given you his Holy Spirit. 
And if that's the case, then there should be an exemplary gentleness coming out of us. We heard an absolutely excellent sermonette this morning down in Reno talking about the light living in us being Jesus Christ, and that light actually shines. And it was interesting because Brent Curtis gave the sermon, and he said, it was interesting because all of a sudden it dawned on me what Christ living in me actually meant. He says, as I met people at the feast this year, and I started talking to them and getting involved in their lives and them involved in my life, he said, I realized what I was doing. I was talking to Jesus Christ. Think about that for a second. When we understand Christ living on us and what that means and that we become a voice box, we become the light, we become an exemplar attitude toward our fellow man in the way that we live, act, talk, and behave, we are actually, in a sense, talking to Jesus Christ to the degree that we're allowing Christ to talk through us. This was a form of behavior that Paul was trying to instill in everybody's life. And he's reminding this church, and keep in, keep in mind, the church at Philippi was a really top-notch church. These people were achievers. These people had accomplished a lot in their lives, spiritually speaking. But he's reminding them because he knows how easy it is to forget some of these things. Verse 6, he said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't think that God knows what you need. God does know what you need. God wants to hear it from your lips because God wants you to understand that once that need is provided for, where it came from. And he goes on, he said, when you do that, when you start living your life in that way, making your needs be made known to God, and then once these needs are satisfied and you look back on your life, be thankful for what you have. I mean, I just had something come across my desk this morning that I sent out to you. You may not have even seen it yet on email. It was a prayer request for a young man in Dayton, Ohio. He's 13 years old. He has this horrifying disease where it blisters on the outside of the skin, start, start erupting, and start burning, and it can actually cause death. Can you imagine dying from burning blisters all over your body? It's poor kids in the hospital now. And I read that. And I really felt bad for him, and I said a prayer right there on the spot, and I sent it out. It's a prayer request for everybody else. As I was driving to Reno today, we're talking and enjoying the weather and everything. Like I started thinking to myself, I have healthy children. There's no major trauma with any member of my family. They're all healthy. They're all strong. They're all vital. And right there while I was driving, I just said, thank you, God, for what I've got for what you've given me. Sometimes we take those little simple things of life for granted. We got three brand new babies over in Reno, about ready to have a brand new baby here. And they're all beautiful. They're all healthy. They're all strong. They're all marvelous. And we, God said, be thankful for those things, what you do have. He said, I'm giving these things to you so that you can appreciate who I am, your God, your provider, your sustainer. He said, then when we live like that, we behave like that, verse 7, and then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. A transformation actually takes place inside of us. There's a change. I don't know if it's a chemical change, a spiritual change, an emotional change, but there is a change that takes place when we start living our lives like this. And Paul's saying, you know what? It'll start creating a peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that all of a sudden you have and you don't even understand why you have it, whereas an hour ago you didn't have peace. Let's go back to the feast for a moment. Have you ever noticed how when you're there at the feast, this unique peace seems to pervade the whole arena? There's a whole different spirit when you walk in, especially the opening service of the Feast of Tabernacles. Or instead of 60, 70 people, you got 600 or 700 people, maybe even 1,200 or 1,000 or whatever. 1,200 individuals, 600 individuals, all exuding God's spirit. And I believe what happens is when we get a concentration of that, something transforms. There's a different environment in which we're living. We all call it feast fever or whatever terminology you want to give to it. But it's God's spirit working with God's people. And it's exciting, and it's fun to watch, and it's wonderful to participate. There's a calm. 
There's an excitement. Uh, there's an anticipation going to the feast, isn't there? All of a sudden, you're in this en- uh, environment where you know for eight solid days you're going to be with people who believe like you do. You're going to hear messages talking about God's future plan for all of mankind and how positive it is and how powerful it is and how involved we are in every aspect of that plan. And you start learning, as I do every year at the feast, we're involved in something way bigger than us, much, much bigger. But God says we are part of that plan. Each and every one of us has a distinct responsibility and a distinct option. And as we heard this year and every other year, it's bigger, bigger, bigger than any one of us can even begin to imagine. Let's turn over to Psalm 133 now. Psalm 133. This year, as in most past years at Oceanside, and I believe I remember seeing this when I was at Bend, Oregon. I'm not sure I recall seeing it at any other fee site. They may exist. When you walk into the hall at Oceanside, on your left, this year there were four tables, four long tables. And on those four long tables were cards about the size of my notebook, handmade cards made for all of the people who could not attend the feast. I look at that table every year and I'm saddened because that's a, a listing of everybody who couldn't make it. I counted the cards this year in Oceanside. There were 77 cards, 77 people who could not make it to the feast who wanted to be there. Many of those people on that table were friends of mine. Some of them I don't know. A few years ago at the feast in Oceanside, I was struck by those people not being able to attend. And I sent out a challenge. I called it the 200-day challenge while we were at the feast about two, three years ago. And I challenged everybody to take the feast spirit home with them. And while they were there at the feast, establish new friendships. But first and foremost, sign every single card on the tables back at the room. And for the last two years that I've been there, I was able to accomplish signing every single card on those tables. You talk about writer's cramp, 77 cards. And they had to be signed by the fourth day because we had to get them packaged up and then mail them off to everybody. And I did a little plea at the beginning of my sermon when I spoke on the third day. Did a little sales pitch for everybody to get back and to try to sign those cards and let everybody know we're thinking about them, we haven't forgotten them, that we love them. And if you recall, before we went to the feast, I suggested to you when you sign, picture, sign cards like that, don't just put happy feast in your name. Write something to them, like you're thinking about them, like you're really concerned about them. Take a little time. It was really interesting because after the sermon I gave and the sales pitch I did to go sign the cards, one of you sent me a, a picture that you took at the table. The tables were wall-to-wall people. You couldn't find a spot to get to the cards to sign. Everybody was signing the cards. That's the spirit of the feast. That's what God wants. That's what Jesus Christ, that's what Paul's talking about here for each and every one of us. If you recall, uh, people signed on to that 200-day challenge, and I think I shared that with you about three years ago, but let me remind you about some of the things that these people said they were committing to do for the next year. One was sending cards to all those not able to attend services regularly. Not once a year send a card to Betty. Not once a year send a card to Willie. Not once a year send a card to Elva. Not once a year send a card to Ruthie, but regularly. And not once a year call them, maybe never see them, but to consciously decide you're going to make contact with those who can't be here. That was one of the things they decided to do. Also performing random acts of kindness as any opportunity permits itself. Remember, I gave a sermon on that a couple of years. Staying in touch with the people that you met at the feast. Don't just meet them and say, hi, my name's so-and-so. Your name's so-and-so. Hi, where are you from? Oh, okay, you're from Nashville, Tennessee. Great, that's nice to meet you. And talk two or three times. And you come home and say, I, I don't know what their name was, let alone having their name, address, phone number, text, phone messages, email, everything else, so you can stay in touch with them. What's the sense in meeting somebody if you're not going to continue to communicate with them and develop some kind of relationship? 
and getting to know all members more closely, getting to know the ins and outs of everyone's life in the congregation, the energy, the smiles, the energy of the whole spirit of the feast is really, it's, it's, it's an infectious thing to see and to have participated in. That happened in Oceanside, and I'm sure it happened wherever all of you were. Many of the messages seem to be focused on similar approaches to how we live our daily lives and letting the feast be a springboard to becoming better people every day of our lives, every day of the year. Many were commenting about how energizing the spirit was at the feast. Then what happens when we return home? Let's look at part of that answer in Psalm 133. This is a psalm of David, and let's begin in Psalm 133 and verse 1. Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There was a wonderful unity at the feast in Oceanside this year. I can only speak to Oceanside because that's where I was. You walk up and down the aisles, and it was hard to walk down the aisle with somebody not grinning at you, sticking their hand out and saying hi. Even if you had something to do or somewhere to go, you got stopped. Because everybody wanted to interact with everybody. And if you will recall, before we went to the feast, one of the things I suggested to you, and I mentioned it at the feast this year, look around the room and see if there's any lonely people sitting by themselves. I'm not sure they're all lonely, but some people sitting by themselves, not interacting and talking with anybody. You know, at the feast in Oceanside this year, it was hard to find somebody like that. Because everybody in the whole arena was doing this. And that's a wonderful thing. God says it's, it's a phenomenal thing. It brings pleasantness to your life. It brings peace and happiness to your life and joy to the lives of others. God tells us something good comes from all of that. Again, there's this transformation that takes place when we start living our lives like this. Psalm 133, verse 2, It is like precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, the blessing of life forevermore. What a blessing coming from God, life forevermore. Let me read this to you from another translation, the New Living Translation, Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. You can just listen as I read along. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in harmony. This is always a good thing for God's people. <laughs> Living in harmony is wonderful. Nobody wants to live in disharmony. You suffer when you live like that. Verse 2, for harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head when he was anointed, that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life everlasting. If you've ever been in the mountains or in a valley or somewhere and you spent the night out, you camped, and you wake up in the morning and there's dew on everything, you look at that and it's just, it's beautiful when you stop and think about it. It's just like God blessing the earth with all of this gorgeous, glistening moisture. And what David is trying to tell us, that's what harmony is like. Harmony can bring to your life the same thing that, d that dew brings to the earth. Good things start to happen. Good things start to happen in our lives when we focus on simple approaches toward our fellow man. And these are simple, especially to our brethren, people that we know, people that we know are following God's way of life. Turn over John to John 15 now. John chapter 15. Christ pointed out to his disciples and to us back here in John 15 that there is a behavior that he expects all of us to exemplify in our lives. In 12 different locations in the New Testament, 12 different locations in the New Testament, we are told to love one another just as Christ loves us. And if we have Jesus Christ living in us, as I know we do, this becomes more a part of our being. Jesus Christ wants to love himself. Jesus Christ wants to love his fellow sisters and brothers. 
If Jesus Christ is living in me and Jesus Christ is living in you, Jesus Christ wants you and me to love each other. It's that simple. That's the bottom line where this is all coming from. But you know, it's, the interesting thing is the more we live like that, the more it becomes natural. And I'll share something with you in just a moment about that. Let's look at a couple of times where love one another is used by Christ here in John 15. Let's begin in John 15 and verse 12. Christ speaking here, he said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Christ points out that he set the precedent for us. He set the standard for us. And he took the concept of loving one another to the ultimate level, as we'll see here. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends, which is exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and me. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you, he says. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus Christ is saying that everything that we need to live our lives, he has given to us in the form of a book. He said, it's all here. Nothing's missing. There's no hidden things. There's no hidden agendas. It's all there. Everything that we need to live our lives as Christians. And he goes on in verse 16, he said, you did not call, choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. Now, there's an interesting corollary made here. First of all, he says, I called you and appointed you that you should go out and bear fruit. In other words, living our lives in a way that starts looking more like Jesus Christ living. He said, but not just bear fruit. I need you to go out and bear fruit and that fruit to be sustained. He's probably saying, don't just put on a facade like you're acting to be a Christian, and then when you're off alone, you're not acting like that anymore? He said, no, I want you to let that become a part of your being. And what did he say would happen if we produce fruit and we keep that fruit flowing and producing in our lives? Tail end of that verse. That your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. We produce fruit as Christians, living our lives the way Jesus Christ asked us to, and he said, God's going to answer your prayers. Bottom line. Simple price to pay. And then he goes on. These things I command you, verse 17, that you love one another. This was and still is a command. It's not a, an occasional option. We need to think about that. And perpetuating the spirit of of the feast comes from just that, developing this love and bond for other human beings. You may have met somebody that you're now good friends with. And when you meet somebody at the feast and they become your friend, those are typically friends that are going to last for a long time, really deep quality friendships, both for you and for them. Let me ask you a question, but let's turn to Romans 13 first. Romans chapter 13. Here's your question. Don't, don't respond, okay? Don't blurt it out. When was the last time that you told someone other than a family member that you love them? Maybe I should ask, when was the last time you told anybody you love them? I know... This kind of a comment is much harder for most men than it is women. I know it was for me. The concept of me telling a man that I love him just didn't equate in my mind years ago. But the more I did it, the more it felt comfortable and the more it felt natural. I now have several male friends whom after I have had a conversation with or visited with or texted or emailed or phoned or whatever, we end our conversations with love you, love you, bud, love you, man, or love you, my friend. And it goes both ways. And Jackie and I have started practicing this years and years ago. I remember when I first went to Columbus, Ohio, 
one of the first sermons I gave, I was, started, I was reading one of, this pastor, one of the uh, scriptures where Paul said, greet each other with a holy kiss. I said, okay, we won't go for the, the holy kiss kind of thing, but what he's saying is give each other a hug. You know, be, be affectionate toward one another. Don't be afraid to hug somebody. And I told everybody back there, I said, I'm a hugger. So all of you guys beware. And they all looked at me like I was weird. And I'll never forget the first guy, when it came down off the stage, this guy was a big, tall deacon. And I went up and said, hi, I'm Joe Horchak. And I gave him a hug. Nice to meet you. He went. <laughs> and he just stood there and looked at me. But you know, before I left, every time he saw me, he said, love you, man, love you. It came across his lips for the first time. I'll never forget the first time I ever heard another man say that to me. I had said it to them. But they were reluctant. And I know many people, this is a hard thing to do. But it's a good thing to do. It's something all of us could do more of. And not only just do it, but mean it. Before we get to Romans 13, let me share a short story with you. A short story about taking time for others. As a young and successful executive was traveling down a neighborhood street going a bit too fast in his brand new Jaguar, a brick smashed into the Jag side door. The angry driver slammed on the brakes and backed the Jag up to where the spot where the brick had been thrown. He jumped out of the car and grabbed the nearest kid and pushed him up against the car, shouting at him, what was that all about? Who are you? What the heck are you doing? That's a brand new car, and that brick's going to cost me a lot of money because you hit my car with your stupid brick. The young boy was apologetic, and he said, please, mister, please. I'm sorry, but I didn't know what else to do. I threw the brick because no one else would stop. With tears dripping down his face and off of his chin, the youth pointed to a spot just around a parked car. It's my brother, he said. He rolled off the curb and fell out of his wheelchair, and I can't lift him up. Now sobbing, the boy asked the stunned executive, Would you please help me get him back in the wheelchair? He's hurt, and he's too heavy for me to lift. Moved beyond words, the driver tried to swallow the rapidly swelling lump in his throat. He hurriedly lifted the handicapped boy back into the wheelchair then took out a linen handkerchief and dabbed off the fresh scrapes and cuts off the boy's knees. A quick look told him everything was going to be okay. Thank you and may God bless you, the grateful child told the stranger. Too shook up for the words, the man simply watched the boy push his wheelchair-bound brother down the sidewalk toward their home. What's the moral of the story? Don't go through life so fast that someone has to throw a brick to get your attention. Paul also wrote a lot about the concept of loving one another, as we can see here in Romans 13. If you had to sum up the theme at the feast in Oceanside this year, I'd say it's living your faith daily by walking the walk and caring for others. Let's look here in Romans 13 and look at yet another comment by Paul about how we treat each other in life. Romans 13, verse 8. Paul writes here, he says, Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law, restating Christ's commandment that we read just a little bit earlier. A simple but very huge concept in life. Verse 9, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are all summed up by this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Learning how to love, live with and love our neighbors is what the law is all about. Getting along with humanity, caring for each other, getting to the point of actually loving each other. As we get ready to close, let's go back to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. 
Jesus Christ talked about this kind of behavior when he was discussing the kingdom of heaven and what it would be like. And just coming back from the feast, we heard a lot about the kingdom of heaven, didn't we? And God's plan for salvation and God's plan for all of mankind. Let's look here again in Matthew 25, where Jesus Christ challenges us with this whole concept of developing relationships with human beings in a way that starts pleasing Jesus Christ himself. As we read this passage, think about the moments at the feast, maybe this year or years gone by, where you had another opportunity to bring a little joy or peace or happiness to another human being's life. It may have just been sitting down and chatting with them for two or three minutes. It may have been something else. Look at this and focus on this as a motivator to keep yourself going for the next year between now and Passover to the next Holy Day, as we heard earlier. It's important to continue in this spirit. Matthew 25, let's begin in verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And we just celebrated this with the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day. Phenomenal period of time in history, yet prophetically speaking. Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a, as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. So it's going to be the sifting that's going to be taking place. And I believe Jesus Christ is sifting with you and me on a day-to-day basis. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats are going to be on his left hand. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. It's a summary of the plan of God in a few words. And then he goes on and he says something interesting to them. He said, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. In other words, the totality of life and the way that we treat each other. Jesus Christ is giving us a total synopsis about what kind of interaction we can possibly have with each other in life. And then in verse 37, then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? And when did we see you thirsty and give you any kind of drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And here's the key. Verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Brethren, this is, the, this is what the feast spirit is all about. Caring for one another, taking care of one another, loving one another, thinking about each other's needs and doing something about it. We have plenty of opportunities right here in this congregation. If you need somebody to pray for, come up and see me, and I'll give you a name or two, and I'll tell you some things you can be praying about. We have some people in this congregation going through some serious issues, people in Reno going through serious issues, challenges of life that are just throwing them into tailspins. We can help. Each and every one of us can help if we know what the need is and we do something about it. Have a wonderful Sabbath.